let's get this thing started. Okay, hello everyone. Hi, hope you're well. Let's actually just jump into it. So one thing I do wanna mention before I begin is I sent uh, an email a few minutes ago uh, with a link to the Zoom room. I know all of you who have it, who are here have it, but I just wanna make sure that you actually receive that email. So I've been sending out email from multiple sources over the past few days because I know people have been joining the class um, and might not be on my roster. So I sent through CUNY first, through Blackboard and through Jupyter grades. But um, as time goes on, I'll be relying most of the time, if not all the time on Jupyter grades to send out that blast. So if you did not receive an email uh, from me from Jupyter grades, uh, make sure that you email me and let me know that, hey, I didn't see that email. Because otherwise you might miss some important communication from me in the future. So make sure that you check up on that. Um, besides that, uh, nothing really to say. Last time we covered integration by parts, we also looked at uh, tabular integration, which is just a more streamlined version of integration by parts, especially when you have to do it over and over. It also works in every case that integration by parts works in. So if you love tabular integration, you can always do that instead of integration by parts. Um, have some more people trickling in here. Um, but now what I want to do is move on to the next section, uh, which is trig integrals. Um, after this, we're gonna go into trigonometric substitution, but before we do that, we need to know how to deal with trig integrals in general. Um, so we're going to start the lesson. I'm gonna stop my video uh, and let's actually just jump into it. So nothing fancy here. Uh, the main idea in this section is to use trig identities to help us solve integrals. And of course, trig identities, we're talking about the basic ones like the Pythagorean identities, cosine squared plus sine squared equals one, uh, or one plus tangent squared equals secant squared, uh, and things like you know the double angle formulas and the half angle formulas, which are kind of the same thing. Um, but formulas like that, these formulas, these identities that you learned back in pre-calc, uh, it turns out that when we have integrals that involve trig functions, purely trig functions, uh, they can come in, um, uh, they can come in handy. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, there are some specific cases that I'm going to talk about, but in the meantime, we're just going to jump into it, uh, jump into the deep end, see if we can actually figure out some of these things on the fly. So I want us to cover three integrals uh, right now in the beginning. And I would like you guys to kind of tell me, uh, what do you think, uh, how do you think we should approach these guys? So yes, that is, um, take it away. Here's the first integral just to jump right in. Uh, the integral of tangent squared. How would you integrate that? Yes, three steps first. Good. <laughs> Abdullah Rahman. <laughs> you always do the three steps first. Is there a basic rule for this? No. Is there, can I simplify this to look like a basic rule? No. No. Can you? Not really, actually. You know, they've used what you can actually use is the trigonometric identities, which is secant square x minus one. And if you okay, so that know, is that is a way to rewrite it in a way to to get a basic rule. So the answer is yes, right? I could rewrite this. Uh, well, why am I in red ink? I could rewrite this uh, to look like a fashion that would do a basic rule. Tangent squared is equal to secant squared x minus one. And it turns out that this, the integral of secant squared is a basic rule that we know. What is the integral of secant squared? Ten x, 10 x. Right, it's tangent x. And of course the integral of one is just going to be x. So yeah, this is tangent x minus x plus c. All right. So that was step two, rewrite the integral in a simpler form, quote unquote. Simpler means uh, it looks like some basic rule that we know. So that was, uh, that's that one. So that's what I mean by using trig identities to kind of help us out. Sometimes a trig identity allows us to simplify a trig integral into a nicer form. What about this one, tangent x?
How would you deal with that one? Actually, if you were to think about the, you know, integration of trig, think about, think about LNs, like, you know, the derivatives of LNs, like, let's say LN of secant x. If you were to take the derivative of it, it would be secant x tangent x over secant cross cancel, you would get tangent x. It's like, you know, the reverse of an integrate, reverse of integration, okay. you know, according to um, what I doubt. Okay, for this situation that works out, but I probably wouldn't say in general that if someone sees a trig, they should think about LN. I, I, I wouldn't really say that as a general principle. Um, here, what we can do is the LN is going to come into play because we can rewrite tangent, as some people suggested, as sine x over cosine x. And now you can do a substitution. U equals the cosine your du is going to be minus sine x dx. And so by doing that, uh, your integral is going to become minus the integral of one over u du. And so that's how the ln comes into play. And so we have uh, minus ln of cosine absolute value plus c. That is going to be it. Why, now, why not ln of C, no, not ln of absolute value C can X plus arbitrary constant Because C. it is the same thing. So uh, Jason thinks that this should be ln of absolute value secant. Can anyone reconcile these two? Is it that there is a negative in front of the ln of the Okay, absolute value so what does that mean? What can I do with that? You can add it as an exponent to cosine of x. Right, so there's a log rule that says if something is multiplying a logarithm, I can move it up as an exponent of the thing being logged. And of course, that is cosine to the minus one power, that is secant. So that is, it is exactly equal to that. Um, so they, these are both correct answers. In fact, I would say at this point, the integral of tangent x should now be a basic rule that you know. You can memorize it either as ln of secant in absolute values plus c, or you can remember it as the integral of tangent is negative ln of cosine plus c. And I would double asterisk these uh, to say that I would rather you uh, memorize this as a basic rule. So from now on, this is just, again, something that we know. In fact, I think it probably was in our set of basic rules. Was it in that table? Yeah, it's right here, ln of secant. So that is a basic rule that we know, but that's how the rule came about. So now you know. Uh, let's look at the, this last example here. Uh, integral of secant. Okay, ideas. You would have simplify. Simplify how? So secant equals to one over cosine. Okay. And then what? You say a lot of cosine, uh, a lot of absolute value of cosine. Let's see. Why would it be ln of absolute value of cosine? It's like one over x. It is not like one over x. It's one over cosine of x. Yeah, would you do substitution? Okay, the, the error that was just made, by the way, uh, if you go back to lecture one, you see if you read uh, point four here, right? see here, it is also wrong to think that one over f of x dx is equal to ln of the absolute value of f of x. That was the error that was just made, okay? You have to be careful. This is not always true, okay? 
you only have, it's only one over a linear function that will give you ln. The only way that if you don't have one over a linear function giving you ln, it means that you have to be able to use substitution to get one over a linear function, right? So having a one over cosine of x is not, uh, you don't automatically think ln in that case. Right? So one over anything, the integral of that isn't ln of the thing. You have to be very careful. The kind of function that is in the denominator, it matters. It has to be a linear function to get ln, or you have to be able to do a substitution to make it look like a linear function. So here we have a fraction where it's not a linear function in the denominator. However, by going through a substitution, we transform it to be a linear function in the denominator. So be careful. So this is not ln of absolute value of cosine. Uh, other ideas. So you'd substitute cosine of x. What would happen if we do that? Like u equals cosine of x. Your du would be minus sine of x dx. What would we do with that? Solve for dx and then substitute it in back into the, uh, the equation. Okay, so your dx would be du minus du over sine of x. If I substituted that, uh, what would happen? I would have minus du over sine of x, and then I would have one over u from the cosine. Can I do anything with that? you ln uh, 1 over u now? No, there is a sine of x here. Someone's pulling out the big guns, tabular method. I mean, so you're thinking of using integration by parts with this guy? Okay. Uh, let me let me uh, help you guys out here. Here's an interesting way to do this one. Uh, so you wouldn't do a u equals cosine. Okay, suppose I took secant of x, and here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to multiply this by secant x plus tangent x and divide it by secant x plus tangent x. And at the moment, don't worry about why I would do that, but just understand what I'm doing, okay? Uh, does anyone see what to do now? Also, in a response to Kayla's uh, suggestion, no, you cannot randomly square things. But here was something I did, which I admit seems random, but it is something that's valid al algebraically. It's essentially multiplying by one. Does anyone see how this helps? Wait, is this supposed to be integration by parts? Well, look at, look at what I just wrote. Okay, so I'm, I'm steering you to a certain direction here. So you would have secant squared of x, and I think we know the integral of that. Secant squared of x. Plus 10x secant x. Um, out, out, yeah, over secant x plus 10x. Okay, now what? Now it looks a little bit messy at the beginning, but do you see anything now? What do you see? I could separate secant squared x plus 10 x secant x and have one over secant x plus 10 x. Would secant x plus 10 x become u? Would have one over u times secant squared x plus 10 x secant x? I'm not sure why you would split up the top. What if we did this? Just do the last part of your statement. u equals secant x plus tangent x do a substitution. 
then your du is going to be uh, the derivative of uh, secant is secant x tangent x, and the derivative of tangent is secant squared x. <clears throat> Gasp. What do you notice? <laughs> That gave us the numerator. So this actually would become the integral of one over u du, which we know is ln of absolute value of u plus c. So this is ln of secant x plus tangent x plus c. In fact, this, and we kind of ran into the other uh, examples here. In fact, this is now something that I would want you to know as a basic rule. The integral of secant is ln of secant x plus tangent x. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that's in the table as well that we looked at yesterday. Boom, 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 boom. It's uh, one of those basic rules, something that we know now, right? Which is... Yeah, who saw that? It's a very, I know, it's one of those things where it's like a magic math. Someone pulls something out of a hat and you're like, where are you going with this? And then suddenly you realize, wow, that's genius. Okay, so uh, I didn't come up with this strategy. Obviously, this was done uh, many, many centuries before me. But it is, believe it or not, the standard way to actually approach this integral. Someone just kind of noticed uh, a pattern. Well, if I were to multiply and divide by this thing, it will actually get me something uh, convenient. Um, the integral of cosecant x is actually a similar uh, strategy. Um, but this one, yeah, admittedly, it's something that kind of comes out of a hat. All the obvious approaches where, oh, change it to one over cosine, do a, do a substitution. The obvious approaches won't deal with this guy here. Uh, there's going to come a point where I'm going to give you guys another way of figuring out this integral that's going to be a lot more constructive. It's not going to seem like, oh, it came out of nowhere. But this is actually the standard way to approach this particular integral. Someone figured out this technique a very long time ago, and we all kind of adopted it. This is just something that we know how to do now. Just multiplying and divide by a weird function to get things to work out. That is the standard way to deal with secant x as an integral. Uh, we'll actually do another way uh, later on, but yeah. Now, these integrals, most of them, like this uh, is not, the integral of tangent squared isn't really something that I would say you should memorize as a basic rule because it simplifies to something that goes to basic rules that you already have memorized. But what I would say is you definitely want to memorize the integral of tangent. You need to know that. Either version of this answer that you memorize is fine. And you definitely want to memorize the integral of secant. Um, so everyone remembers the integral of sines and cosines, but the integral of secants and tangents is going to be very useful for this section and all future sections. Uh, and I put in red here, this is just, not that it's something that is true in general, but it's definitely true for how we will run the class. Um, we are, for the most part, going to ignore cosecants and cotangents, right? So we're going to be dealing with sines and cosines and various forms of them. Uh, we're going to be dealing with secants and tangents and various forms of them. But it turns out that the strategies that work with secants and tangents are very similar. They work very, they're analogous to the strategies that we would learn with cosecants and cotangents. So the idea is, if we teach you about secants and tangents, it's automatically teaching you about cosecants and cotangents. Uh, the thing is just, there's gonna be a sign change. So there's no need to have you memorize an extra bunch of formulas. Uh, it's just kind of superfluous. Teaching about secants and tangents, you'll automatically know how to deal with cosecants and cotangents. So by routine, we ignore things. And this is why, if you, if you look back at uh, our basic integral formulas, I scratched out the formulas that had to deal with cotangents. Um, because the, the integral of cosecant it's actually the same strategy as the integral of secant. You multiply it and divide by cosecant plus cotangent over itself. Um, so the same strategies are going to work. So we normally ignore the uh, cosecants and cotangents. So that's just something. So if you're going through and you're studying and you want to know, what do I have to memorize? You can pretty much ignore anything that involves a cosecant and a cotangent. Other than, I guess, the very basic 
things. Like you need to know what a cosecant and cotangent is, of course. But when it comes to integration, uh, we're not going to uh, concern ourselves with them uh, very much. So that's just something you should know. And I put that in red here. Um, all right. But um, once we move forward, uh, knowing these guys, especially knowing the last two examples as basic rules, they will definitely be very helpful to us moving forward. So now what we're going to do is we're going to cover trig integrals. So in this section, they cover these cases here. So this is what we're going to go over. So what we're going to do is we're going to learn with how, how to integrate products of sines and cosines where the sines and cosines are raised to powers, products of secants and tangents where the secants and tangents are raised to powers, and then just functions, random combinations of sines and cosines and random combinations of secants and tangents. In the first two cases, we're going to be assuming that the powers are integers, um, even though in general they don't have to be integers, but we're going to learn how to deal with them if they were integers. And then, it's, it's strange to say, but yeah, for the most part, you're expected to somehow by osmosis also know how to deal with more random combinations, even if powers are not integers. A lot of the lessons that we learned from looking at these situations will apply to those situations. And uh, I'll give you guidelines on how to uh, do this, do these, deal with these two guys as we move forward. But we're gonna deal with cases one and two in great detail. And then I'll show you some strategies that we can use with uh, cases three and four. In fact, the strategies that would work with cases three and four is the strategy that I always gave you. Oh, does this thing look like a basic rule? Can I simplify? Can I try a substitution? Can blah, blah. You'll have to go through. It's not going to be as straightforward. Uh, for section one, this is very straightforward. Every case that can occur here for integer values of the powers, uh, we know how to deal with it very specifically. For secants times tangents, there are two scenarios that we know very well how to deal with but the other scenarios are kind of a little bit tricky. We'll go over those, but we're going to start with case one. So let's begin with case one, okay? So let's look at the fact of, uh, of the situation when we have uh, a form, the integral of sine to the nth power of x times cosine to the nth power of x dx, where m and n are integers. How can we look at an integral of this form? Okay, so that's the first thing we're gonna cover. One thing I want you to notice is that we have four possible cases here in terms of whether the, int the integers are odd or even. Um, so case one, you can have M is odd and N is even. Uh, case two, you can have M is even, N is odd. By the way, the first two cases are very similar. You just switch the roles of sines and cosines. Uh, you can have another case where both integers are odd and you can have a fourth case where both integers are even. We're gonna deal with these one by one. I'm gonna tell you the strategies for approaching them. And then we are going to uh, begin. So here's case one, okay? So case one is when the power of sine is odd and the power of the cosine is even, okay? Here's how you deal with such a case. One, you're going to save a factor of the sine function. What that means is you literally just factor off a sign and put it to one side and don't do anything with it. Two, you are going to change all other signs into cosines. You are going to use a trig identity to help you do this. Of course, cosine squared plus sine squared equals one. You're then going to substitute u equals cosine. This will give you something a little bit more convenient and then you're going to integrate it. And that's it, that's the strategy, right? That will always work if you, the power of sine is odd and the power of the cosine is even. Let's actually see this in action. So let me do maybe the first example for you, okay? So here's an example. Let's make this a little bit bigger. All right. So here's this random integral that shows up. It is a product of sines and cosines. Now, if I see this on a quiz or a test, I'm going to like, oh yeah, Juan told us about this in class. And all right, what did he say was the rule again? All right, so you have an odd power of sine and an even power of cosine. What is the strategy? Well, one, you're going to save a factor of the sine, meaning you're going to take off a factor of sine 
you're going to factor it off and move it to the back. So here, that's what we're doing. Uh, save a factor of the sign. Okay, that is step one. Step two, you are going to change all other signs to cosines. How can you change all other signs to cosines? Well, using the Pythagorean identities. Sine squared is going to be one minus cosine squared. So that was the second thing that we we're supposed to do. Change all other sines to cosines. Now this is nice because if the power of sine is odd, once we factor off a sine, the remaining power is going to be even. So we'll definitely be able to get a sine squared in play. And by getting the sine squared, we would be able to figure out, get a cosine squared in there, change all other sines to cosines. That is the second step. Now we do the third step, u equals We're going to do u equals cosine. That was the third step. Substitute u equals cosine. Then our du is going to be minus sine of x dx. And you'd realize that the sine of x dx is right here. So you can actually just substitute that in. So this has become minus the integral of one minus u squared times u squared du. And at this point, now you just four integrate. Of course you back substitute at the end, right? So that is going to be u to the fourth minus u squared. So that's u to the fifth over five minus u cubed over three plus c. And the u was the cosine. So this becomes cosine to the fifth x over five minus cosine cubed x over three. And that is our integral. Professor, what happened to the minus sign? Um... Mul I've multiplied it in. Right. I mean, this would oh, this okay. this here would be uh, u squared minus u to the fourth, and I just turned it around u to the fourth minus u squared. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Do we do we see how this method works? All right, okay, so now your turn. Someone help me with this one. We're already gonna bump into case two. Okay, sine cube x, go. So you the first uh, save a factor of sine x? Right. First of all, I want you to notice that the cosine doesn't even appear. What does that mean in terms of the form that we were discussing? Right, n equals zero. Notice here, the power of cosine is zero. And zero, this is even. So it is the case. So if you're in the case where one of these functions do not appear, you can still think of it in this category, right? So remember zero is an even number. So even also includes the situation where one of the trig functions doesn't even visibly appear in the, in the, in the, in the integrand. So, all right. So yeah, this is definitely is case one, which means I'm going to save a factor of sine then what?
change all other assigns to cosines. So this is saved. We're not going to do anything with it, but I'm going to change all every other instance of sines to cosines, one minus cosine squared. Do a substitution, u equals cosine. Then the integrals are going to become one minus u squared du. Or that's going to be u cubed over three minus u plus c. So that is going to be cosine cubed x over three minus cosine x plus c. And that's that one. Excuse me, why isn't it like cosine cubed x over, why isn't it cosine cubed x over three minus x plus arbitrary constant c? Why would it be an x? You know, if you want So this here, if you look at this, right, what it, you would split it up, right? You could have this as the integral of u squared du minus the integral of 1 du, okay? So you have the integral of 1 du. u is the variable. So the integral of 1 is u. Oh, why isn't it u minus, like, you know, what u cubed over 3? It is, but there's a negative sign on the outside. Right? Be careful what you're integrating with respect to. This is a du integral, means u is the variable. So the integral of a constant is that constant times u, not x. All right, uh, moving on to case two. So case two is when uh, m is even and n is odd, right? So the power of the sine is even, the power of the cosine is odd, okay? Now it turns out, obviously this is pretty much, uh, it's kind of like a reverse of the other scenario. So the, the, the rules are very similar. You just sine and cosine switch roles. So instead of saving a factor of the sine, you would save a factor of the cosine. Then you would change all other cosines to sines. Okay, how do I change cosine to the fourth to sine functions? One minus sine squared squared. Right, so cosine to the fourth, this is the same as cosine squared squared. So then this is going to be one minus sine squared squared. Then I would do u equals the sine. Your du is going to be cosine. And so this is going to become the integral of u squared times one minus u squared squared du. All right, how do I do that integral? We're running into case three here. Let's move these to the side. Okay, what happens here? How do we get through this? Ideas? Substitute again? What would you substitute? I mean, I don't think a substitution is going to work here. This is more of a, a step two kind of thing, right? This is uh, simplified to be able to use a basic rule thing, which goes with uh, Abdullah's just distribute, right? 
I can expand this. This is 1 minus 2u squared plus u to the fourth. And then distribute. u squared minus 2u to the fourth plus u to the sixth. So I rewrote it so that I can use the power rule. So that's u cubed over 3 minus uh, 2 fifths u to the fifth uh, plus u to the 7 over 7. And in this case, our u was uh, sine. All right, so very similar. So now we know how to do with those two scenarios, case one and case two. Let's look at case three. So now case three was when both of them were odd. Both the power of the sine and the cosine is odd. Okay, now how do we deal with that? Here's the strategy. You're going to save a factor of the trig function with the smaller power, right? So whichever one has a smaller power, that's the one you're going to save. Then you're gonna change the other trig function, whichever one had the larger power, into the one that you save, right? So if you save the factor of sine, you're gonna change all other signs to cosines. If you save the factor of cosine, you're gonna change all other cosines to sines, et cetera. Then you're gonna substitute the other function. Then you're gonna integrate. So uh, here is an example, sine cubed times cosine to the fifth. We're going to integrate that, OK? Now, in my suggestions, I do suggest uh, saving a factor of the smaller power, the trig function with the smaller power. Um, so when I do that, I also want us to do, go the other way. What would have happened if we saved the factor of the larger power, and what would have uh, occurred? OK? Um, so let's actually go with the strategy of saving the smaller power. In this case, I have sine cubed and cosine to the fifth. The sine function has the smaller power. So what I would do is I would save a factor of the sine. Change all other signs to cosines. Then do a u equals cosine. This is going to give me the integral minus the integral of 1 minus u squared, u to the fifth, du. I can expand this. This is going to be u to the seventh minus u to the fifth, du. This is going to be u to the eighth over 8 minus u to the fifth over 5, plus constant. And our u was the cosine. So this is going to be cosine to the eighth minus cosine to the fifth plus constant. What was the question actually? Let me, let me check. Oh, the original was sine cubed times cosine to the fifth. Okay. Can you please go back to the earlier problem? Because there is like, you know, one thing uh, I would like to address, like, you know, the... Oh, with the problem. sine squared cosine to the fifth? Not this one, earlier. Oh, how earlier? The first one, actually. A? Talking about, yeah, the A. Yeah? So, according to what I got, I got 1 over 5 cosine x to the fifth power subtract 1 over 3, you know, cosine x to the cube. So if you were to like, you know, really to integrate it, multiply by negative one, you know, the signs would switch. Yes. So yeah, but the signs didn't really switch in this problem. How come in like B, the signs switched? The sign didn't switch. I, I, I'm, there was no sign switch. I took the, the negative, negative sign from the outside and multiplied in. 
right? Remember, so whenever your U is a cosine, you are going to have a negative sign on the outside because your du is going to be minus sine x dx. So if, you're, if your u is a cosine, there is going to be a sign change that comes from multiplying a negative 1 on the dx. If your u is a sine, there is no sign change. So that's the difference. So there's a sign change here, and there was a sign change here, uh, but there was no sign change in this one. So that's the difference. Here there's a sign change and it comes from the du, All right? So this would mean that your du is minus sine x. So that's where the sign change is coming from. Okay, now let's uh, go the other way. Uh, and this is case four. Lots of examples in case four. Let's move this to the side though. Get it out of the way. Okay, also save a factor of the larger power and compare. So before we had sine cubed cosine to the fifth, right? And we saved the sine. I, I just want you guys to see what would have happened had you saved the larger power, right? So sine cubed cosine to the fifth. What if someone decided to save the cosine instead? Would they have gotten the problem wrong? Well, let's see. Say I factor off a cosine. Okay. All right. Help me finish this up. If I did that, what would the next step be? Let's say someone saw that, oh, I'll just factor off a cosine. What would have happened? What would the next step look like? Okay, substitute cosine to the fourth with one minus sine to the fourth. How would that work? No, you're making this error. Here, distributing powers across sums. That's what you just did. Cosine to the fourth is not one minus sine to the fourth. So be careful of that. Note to self. No need to apologize. Uh, it, it's good that you guys tell me everything now, tell me all your mistakes now, so that I can correct them before the quiz or a test happens. So yeah, nothing to apologize for. Okay, keep going. Um, how would I continue, right? This is why I wait for you guys to actually give me suggestions, because if there's any misconceptions out there, I want to know they're out there so that I can correct them. Right, now you would, you would think of, again, the cosine to the fourth as cosine squared, squared. So this would be sine cubed x of one minus sine squared, squared. Now, if you distributed the power, which is not the right thing to do, but if you took the two and distributed the power, you would get one minus sine to the fourth, but this is incorrect that is distributing a power across the sum, which is not correct to do. You would have to expand the parentheses, right? You would do, at this point, you would do like a u equals sine function. Your integral would then become u cubed times one minus u squared squared du. Now we can still get through this, but I want you to notice this is harder than what we did last time. So it's not that you get it wrong. It's that you're giving yourself more work by saving a factor of the larger guy. And in fact, if 
if say this five was something larger, like 17, then what would have happened is this power would have been 16. And then you would have to do this raised to the eighth, right? And it's going to be significantly harder, right? So, however, even if this were 16 in this scenario, it's not going to be affected. That would have been seven. If, if this were 17, that would have been 17. I would just have a U to the 17 that I can distribute easy, right? You will always work less by saving a factor of the smaller power, right? So that's why this recommendation is there for the smaller power. You might say, do I have to save the smaller power? The answer is no. But if you save the larger power, just understand that algebraically speaking, you're going to have to work harder to get to the answer. Right? And who wants to work harder? We want to work smarter, not harder. So that's what would have happened had we saved a, a factor of the larger power, right? And we could finish this, but I won't. We could finish, but we won't. All right. Uh, let's move on to... Uh, the last case, the case where the both powers are even, where did I move that? I think I moved it to the side somewhere. Okay, here it is. Case four, this is when both powers are even. All right, so in this case, let me Eventually, we're going to do these, let's move these off to the side. Okay, case four, both your sine and your cosine have even powers, okay? Now, how would you deal with that? It turns out in this situation, you apply the double angle formulas. Technically, that should be a double hyphen angle, right? It's pretty much the same as the half angle formulas, in fact. It's just another way of writing the half angle formulas. So use the double angle formulas. Now the double angle formulas is the formula, um, in fact, you use the double angle formula for cosine, if that helps. That's why you have a cosine two X here. So these are forms that you would have had memorized since pre-calc. So it's nothing new. We've seen this thousand times at this point, okay? With the double angle formulas, remember the, uh, we know that cosine two X is equal to cosine squared X minus sine squared X. This is in fact equal to two cosine squared X minus one. It's also equal to one minus two sine squared. So we can solve for the cosine squared and it would actually give us this guy. And we can solve for the sine squared and it would actually give us that guy, right? So this is using the double angle formula for the cosine, okay? So these are the double angle formulas. And it turns out when both of them have even powers, you apply these formulas, the double angle formulas, and then you simplify and apply the methods that we learned in the previous case as is necessary, okay? So as long as both are even, you keep applying double angle formulas. Eventually you're going to get a situation where when you multiply everything out, you're going to have a mixture of powers or, or an assortment of powers that you can deal with uh, more effectively. So for example, let's do uh, the integral of cosine squared. So here we have uh, both powers are even. The power of cosine is two and the power of the sine function is zero. So what do I do whenever I see a cosine and a sine to an even power? Well, I'm going to apply the uh, double angle formula. This is going to be one half, one plus cosine two X. Okay, so now, uh, what is the, the, so we're just gonna have a half here. The integral of the one is going to be x because it's dx, plus what is the integral of cosine two x? How would you integrate cosine of two x?
It's sine two x over two. Yeah, how did you get that? So technically it's with a substitution, right. And I gave you the formula for the shortcut for substitution. So uh, where did I give that? I don't remember, here. Right, if you have uh, like sine of a constant times, that's just one over the constant times that. So you're applying this rule that I gave you guys last time, right? But technically speaking, it's a substitution, but it's an easy substitution that you don't have to go through substitution. You should be able to do it in your head. So this is one over two sine two x. And that is the answer. And in fact, our second example is very similar. So it's left to the reader. But it's, it's very similar to the, this one. Uh, it's just literally going to be a change in sign. The middle sign is going to be different. Um, so let's move on to C. All right, what do we do here? Cosine squared times sine squared. Ideas, suggestions. You sign as uh, was it sign two uh, x plus cosine two x equals to one, uh, and uh, substitute it to either cosine or sine. Sine two x plus cosine two x is not one. What do you mean? Do you mean sine squared? Yeah. So you wanted to change the sine or the cosine? So you want to do something like this? Is that what you wanted? And what would you do at that point? See, by doing that, you're actually going to get a higher power trig function, right? If you were to multiply this out, you'd have a cosine squared plus, minus cosine to the fourth. So now, instead of dealing with squares, you're now dealing with a fourth degree cosine. So you probably don't want to do that. So let's go back and look at the strategy again. Case four, steps. Apply double angle formulas. That's the first thing you want to try to do. Right, you're gonna change them with the double angle formulas because we're in the situation where they're both even. Now there's going to be a slight variation that we can do here, but I'll, I'll mention that afterwards. So this is going to be one half one plus cosine two X. This is going to be one half one minus cosine two X. And then you can take out the one half times the one half, that's a quarter. And what is one plus cosine two X times one minus cosine two X? You will recognize that as difference of squares because we're all amazing at algebra. So this is just one minus uh, cosine squared two X. Now, there's another way that you could have gotten here. Um, here's another thing that would have happened, right? I know a lot of students would have to foil this out, but you should recognize that a difference of squares and you won't lose too much time because of it. Here's another way though, that you could have, another thing you could have noticed. Realize that this is just a cosine X times sine X all squared. Realize that you can write cosine x times sine x as one half sine two x. And then realize, and this is squared, then realize that that would be a quarter times the integral of sine squared two x, which is in fact what this is. One minus cosine squared is sine squared. So this is actually just sine squared of two x. 
and that would bring you here. So here we use a double angle formula for the sine function. So here's, this is also something that you can remember, or no, it's something that you should remember. Sine of two X is equal to two sine X cosine X. So when you see a product of sine and cosine like that, this should be something that you think about. Uh, and that is what was applied here. Right, so you could use the double angle formula for the sine function first, and then you get here, or you can just apply the double angle formulas for the cosine version of the double angle formulas for each of these individually, multiply out by a difference of squares, eventually we get here. So now we're here. We have the integral of sine squared, right? How do we uh, deal with that? Well, it's not case one. That's an even power on the sign. Do you mean like example one in this section? <laughs> it's like the first example, right? You would deal with it very similar to the first example. You apply the double angle formula, right? It, it's an even power. So you're going to take one half, which now this becomes one eighth, times one minus cosine four X. That's the double angle formula. Then of course here, you're going to do the integral. Integral of one is X because it's dx. Integral of the cosine to the fourth is one fourth sine to the of four x. Cosine of four x. That's that guy. So that's how we would deal with this example. Do I have any other examples here? Oh, yes. Uh, cosine two X has a power of zero. Well, yes. Um, it's in fact an assumption that we can make. Um, you, you don't really need to though. Like if, if, you, if you never considered it, it wouldn't have made a difference. Just changing the sine squared to uh, its double angle formula uh, can work. Okay, whenever you see only even powers around, uh, you want to think of double angle formulas. Okay, let's look at this one. Sines to the fourth times cosine squared. Go, someone tell me how to deal with this. You would apply the double angle formula. Okay, how is that gonna work? Yes, we would apply the double angle formula. How do we get it to work? How, does it, how is it applied in this case? What would it look like if I'm writing it out? Right, the sine to the fourth, you think of as sine squared squared. Then, now you apply the double angle formula for sine. So inside, we're going to have one half, one minus cosine two X. That's going to be all squared. Then we're gonna apply the double angle formula on this one. That's one plus cosine two X. 
So we have that. Then what we're going to do is we're going to square this. The squaring of the one half is going to make it a quarter multiplied by this one half. So we're going to have one eighth on the outside. And then I'm going to have one minus two cosine two x plus cosine squared two x times one plus uh, cosine two x. I mean, there's another way to think of this, but maybe I'll do it that way. So here I would have one minus cosine two x squared times one plus, I, I, I don't even know if it's any easier, but it feels nicer somehow. So we have that. Now realize that what one minus cosine two x and one plus cosine two x is a uh, difference of squares. However, you do have a square here. So you're going to be left over with one of the factors of one minus cosine two x. But then the other thing it's multiplied by is going to be one minus cosine squared two x. And that's because we're seeing this. This is going to be one minus cosine two x times one minus cosine two x times one plus cosine two x. And then these two here is your one minus cosine squared two x. And then this guy's left over, one minus cosine two x. So that brings me to a situation where I just have to FOIL. Or so you're gonna multiply that out, one minus cosine squared two x minus cosine two x plus uh, cosine cubed 2x. So uh, ultimately, that's what we have. All right, now what? And now you would integrate each, uh, each factor. Right, integrate each individually. Uh, so the integral of one is easy, that's x. How do we deal with the cosine squared 2x? How do you deal with the cosine squared 2x? Yeah, we have to apply the half, the double angle formula. Right, again. apply the double angle formula. So for this one here, we're going to think of this as one half times one plus cosine 2x. This we can integrate easily. It's kind of a substitution that you don't even have to do the substitution because you can do it in your head. You know it's gonna just be one half sine 2x. How do we deal with the cubed, cosine cubed 2x? How do we deal with the cosine cubed 2x? Right, you save a factor of cosine. Notice that this is a previous case where we had an odd power of cosine, right? So this is what I meant in case four when I wrote, apply the methods learned in previous cases if necessary. Cosine cubed is a previous case. We understand that when we had odd powers, what we did was we saved one of the odd powers. So we're going to, have a cosine squared, change that to a cosine, which in fact, this is going to end up being one minus sine squared times cosine. Okay, so that's how we're gonna deal with these. And now we're gonna put these all together. So this is going to be equal to one eighth. And this writing out this line is optional. Uh, let me write it in a different color. This line is optional, but it's just so that, because if I, maybe sometimes if I skip steps, it will confuse people. So uh, this here, one dx minus the integral of cos, uh, minus one half one plus cosine two x, applying the double angle formula. This one is going to be the integral of cosine two x 
And then the last one is going to be the integral of one minus sine squared x cosine x dx. So you integrate each of them individually, but each of them have their own strategy. Power rule works on this one. Double angle formula works on that one. Some substitution works on this one. Saving a factor of cosine, changing all of the cosines to sines, and doing a substitution works on this one. So here we're applying a bunch of the strategies all in one problem. But here it will, of course, end up being the integral of this is just going to be x. The integral of this is going to be x plus 1 half sine 2x. The integral of this is going to be minus 1 half sine 2x. And the integral of this is just going to be sine x minus sine cubed x over 3. Let's see. And there we go. Do I have any more examples of, do I leave anything? Okay, I think that's, that's all the examples I had for this case. All right, Whew. put a lot of stuff together there, but uh, hopefully um, you guys followed that. We're gonna to jump to case, uh, not case three, but form three. Okay, so just to review what that was, there are four forms that we want to talk about. Uh, signs and products of sines and cosines where they each have potentially different integer powers, products of secants and tangents, random functions of sines and cosines, random functions of secants and tangents. We covered all the variations of case one just now. Now you know how to deal with all such situations. Um, I'm jumping to case three because it's also involving sines and cosines and we're, we're kind of in that mode. So we're just gonna go down to form three here. Now, it turns out that there is no main strategy. I can't give you a list of steps that's always going to work in every single case here. However, um, based on the rules that you've learned here and on top of the strategies that I told you guys about in yesterday's class and the previous class, you can kind of for, figure out a way to get through uh, form four, form three. So just jumping into it, like I said, there's no general method here. It's really, you just have to creatively combine all the skills I told you about today, as well as the, the skills that you, I told you about yesterday. Um, so here's a random one, cosine cubed uh, over, the square root of sine of x. All right, ideas. Remember your training, grasshoppers. Okay, why are we thinking quotient rule? Quotient rule is a derivative method. It's not an integral method. Could you rearrange your um, expression? How? By putting the sign on top. Uh, so, you mean yeah, so write like, this as cosine cubed x times sine to the one half x? Yeah, but a negative. You could. Yeah, negative half. Okay. And? Now what? <laughs>
Okay, Samia thinks we should take out a cosine. Let's see, what would have happened? And then? Then what? Okay, so some people think we should use the double angle formula. Some people think we should convert using the Pythagorean identities. Okay, who thinks it's double angle formula? Who thinks we use the Pythagorean identities? Okay, remember when the double angle formula comes into play. Now, of course, here you have a half power, so we're technically not in that rule, but Notice that this is an odd power of cosine hanging out here, which means the double angle strategy is not the strategy I would think of. The double angle strategy is when I have integer powers, but they're all even, right? So I wouldn't use the double angle strategy uh, because there's an odd power present, right? Remember your training grasshoppers, right? There's an odd power present. The double angle strategy should not be applied. Okay, so it's the other one. It's the Pythagorean identity. Change this to one minus sine squared. Okay, so now that we know that's the step and hopefully now we see why that's the step, So remember, this, you, you guys should be matching this up, right? So I, I know sometimes I write down these strategies here and it, it doesn't really, it, it's hard to kind of really understand what they mean until you go through a few examples and really see them in action. But again, you have to always be looking back to the strategy, the, the thing that you learn, right? So while I can't give you general ideas, I, I can't give you a general method for this case, now you are seeing how what I taught you, you can apply into strange situations. So you learn, you learn about one, you learn about a strategy that works in a very nice situation, but with a little bit of creativity, you can apply it to other situations as long as it kind of, it kind of looks like the previous situation. So the double angle strategy was applied when everything was even, uh, and we had different strategies for when things were odd. So here, because of the odd power, you realize, you know, it's probably better to use the, the Pythagorean identity strategy as opposed to the double angle strategy, right? So you're kind of using what you learn about in a nicer situation to help you deal with a more complicated situation. Hopefully that makes sense. But this is, this is, uh, this is one of the, jeez, uh, I, I don't wanna even go down this rant. Maybe I shouldn't, maybe I shouldn't open this can of worms. Uh, but this is one of the situations where it's like, people are, students are always like, well, how am I gonna use this in my life? You know, they do things in class and it's a very ideal situation. I'm never gonna use Pythagorean identity in real life. That's not the point, you're missing the point. The idea is when we learn to deal with the simple ideal situations, it turns out using these ideas with a little bit of creativity, we, when we go out in the real world and we're in a messy situation, we're still able to apply the strategies and the thought processes and the wisdom from the ideal situations into more messy situations, just by tweaking things to deal, to, to cover the nastier case that we're looking at, right? So I give you guys strategies. Okay, here's step one, here's step two, here's step three. Really understand those steps, really get good at applying those steps. Life is messier than those steps are for sure, 
but the kind of ideas that you can learn from them. You'll realize that when you're in more complicated scenarios, really it's the simple scenarios that are going to guide you to the light at the end of the tunnel. They're going to tell you, here's the idea that might work. Here's what you have to tweak and finagle to get through this strange problem that you, you didn't know how to deal with before, okay? So all the basic formulas and the basic strategies and the basic definitions, learn them well, my grasshoppers, because they help you to dig yourself out of the really messy, complicated situations. All you need to know, yeah, Pythagorean identity, as Jason said, right? You use these things all, it's a big life lesson here. It's more than, it's beyond this class. And I'm gonna stop here because I can go off and rant about this uh, for a while. Okay, all right. So that being said, now we're here, what do we do? Remember your training grasshoppers. What would be the next step? Substitution, right? What would you substitute? U for Sandwich. Right. Here you see a bunch of signs and you have this cosine here hanging out by itself. That's where you think, oh, wow, I can change all those signs to use and then my cosine is going to be the guy. So now that's like u equals sine of x. Your du is that cosine of x dx. And that's the guy that you have right here just hanging out, waiting to be useful. So then this integral would just become 1 minus u squared u to the minus 1 half du. And that is something that we know how to deal with. Expand parentheses. Uh, that's four over two minus one over two. That's three over two. So now you add one to the power, divide by the new power, uh, add one to the power, divide by the new power plus C. And so this is two times the square root of the sine function minus two fifths times the sine function to the five over two plus C. Arbitrary constant C. So what I got is actually is two parentheses sine X to the half power. Yeah. Subtract two over five parentheses sine X to the five over two power plus arbitrary constant C. Yes, that's the same thing. So the half power means a radical. I just, for, for no reason at all, I just wrote it as a radical instead of as a half power. But yeah, that's, that's the same thing, Jason. Okay, now hopefully we learn something from going through that example. And hopefully you kind of see where the strategies I taught you earlier actually came into play, where you actually use these skills. You weren't in the ideal scenario, but by knowing how to behave in the ideal scenario very well, you were able to, um, did it matter if we kept the radical in the denominator? Uh, technically no, however, at this point, we would have had something like one over the radical of u, and to apply the power rule, you would change it to a power anyway. So eventually you'd want to change it to a power in order to use a, a nice rule. But strictly speaking, we didn't have to. Uh, yeah. Let's go on to secants and tangents. These guys are interesting. Now, at first, these aren't going to seem much different from sines and cosines. We're using, again, the Pythagorean identity is going to come into play. Uh, the version that says one plus tangent squared equals secant squared. That's something we're going to use all the time. However, um, secants and tangents are significantly uh, more challenging. Did I even, yeah, I even wrote that here. They're significantly more complicated to deal with, believe it or not. So here, in, in the case of sines and cosines, we had four cases that you could be in um, that were well understood. We knew the strategies to do them. It was straightforward, follow your nose. Okay, in, for secants and tangents, this is not going to be the case, uh, but I believe in you guys. I believe you can figure it out. You have to be a little bit more creative with secants and tangents, kind of like how this last example with sines and cosines was. Okay. So here are the cases for secants and tangents. And just by looking at the cases, you're going to realize that it's kind of, yeah, we're, we're in a different ball game at this point, right? 
we're not in calc one anymore, kids. If this doesn't wake you up, I don't know what is. Um, so here are the three cases. If you have the integral of sine to the nth power tangent to the nth power, where m and n are integers, how do we deal with those? So here are some three cases. m is even, and tangent is just visible, right? This is especially useful if your m is greater than or equal to four. However, there are some cases where it's not gonna work. So here, it's even not even strictly speaking, the case that we are looking at isn't very well defined, but it's something that we actually know how to deal with. The second scenario is that your n is odd. The power of tangent is odd, right? And especially useful when the secant is present. It's visible somewhere. The third scenario is everything else, <laughs> right? And, and technically, the third scenario will also cover form four, if I'm to be a little bit technical about it, right? Random combinations of secants and tangents will probably fall under the, the third scenario also. Um, so yeah, with signs, with, you can see, already see that the, the cases when it comes to signs and tangents are already themselves kind of not fully well-defined. It's going to take a little bit of luck, a little bit of creativity. Uh, sometimes uh, you're, you're going to see something uh, very, in a very straightforward manner, sometimes not. Uh, they can get quite complicated, uh, as we shall see by going through some examples. But let's go through the first two cases. These are some cases that we actually know how to deal with uh, relatively well. Okay, so now we're gonna look at products of, uh, products of secants and tangents. Let's move this uh, to the side, we'll come back to that. But here's one scenario. The power of secant is even. This is particularly useful when the, uh, the power is greater than or equal to four. Of course, if we had a secant squared, this is why greater than or equal to four is pointed out. Because if you have a secant squared, we already know the integral of that is tangent. That's a basic rule. So really, it's when it's greater than or equal to four is where the strategies I'm telling you now would actually come into play. Okay, so the power of secant is even. Now it's especially, uh, this strategy is especially wonderful if the tangent is present, but it doesn't have to be present. In this first example, it's not present. You can't visibly see it, okay? Here's how we deal with this case. You save a factor of secant squared. You're going to change all other secants if there are any remaining to tangents using this formula. Then you're going to substitute u equals tangent. By doing the u equals tangent, your du is going to give you a secant squared and you already saved that secant squared in step one. So here's how that's going to look. Let's look at the first example. I'll go through this one and then you guys can help me out with the other one. So here I see a secant to the fourth. Hey, the power of secant is even. I don't see any tangents around, but I already know that because the power of secant is even, I should save a secant squared. I'm used to writing signs. So I'm going to save a factor of secant squared. Save this guy. Now, the next step is to change all other secants into tangents. How? Using the identity, the Pythagorean identity. One plus tangent squared is secant squared. And at this point, you follow up with the last step. U equals tangent. Your du is going to be secant squared. And that is the thing that we already saved. So now uh, the integral is going to become one plus u squared du. And of course the integral of one du, remember it's du. So the integral of one is u. That's why it's u and not x because it's not a dx integral plus u cubed over three, plus constant. And you would replace it, the u with the tangent. Correct. You would be replaced with a tangent. Yeah. Okay. So are we good? 
Hopefully we got that. All right, someone help me out with this one. Secant to the fourth times tangent squared. Give me some input quickly because I want to move on to the other cases, at least the other easier cases. Save a secant squared. Right. So this is going to be, you have a secant squared times a tangent squared. Put the secant squared to the side. You're going to save this guy. Next step change all other secants to tangents. How? Using the Pythagorean identity. And then you're going to do a substitution. Uh, you're going to do u equals tangent. Your du is going to be secant squared. And so your integral is going to be 1 plus u squared times u squared du. Now we know how to deal with that. Just expand parentheses. And we can integrate that using the power rule. So this is u cubed over 3 plus u to the fifth over 5 plus c. And so this is tangent cubed over 3 plus tangent to the fifth over 5 plus c. Okay. So that's the first kind of semi-well-defined case that we know how to deal with. Case one, the power of the secant is even, especially if it's larger than or equal to four. Uh, what you do is save a factor of the... Okay. Uh... Oh, someone just... Okay. Uh, yeah. Let's look at case two. Case two occurs when the power of tangent is odd and a secant is visibly present. That is case two. Okay. Now the strategy for that is you actually save a factor of secant times tangent what you'll realize is that that would leave you with an even power of tangent left over. So you can change all of the tangents to secants using the Pythagorean identity, then doing a u equals secant. Once you do a u equals secant, your du is going to be secant x tangent x, which is the factor that you saved in step one. So here's an example. The power of tangent is odd and there's a secant hanging around. What I would do here is save a factor of secant tangent. The only thing that would be left over at this point is going to be you're going to have a tangent left, tangent squared left over, and then there's going to be a secant tangent moved to the side. So we are, we're saving this guy. Then what you're going to want to do is change all other tangents to secants using the Pythagorean identity. This is going to be secant squared minus 1. Then you do a u equals secant. Your du is going to be secant tangent. And so this will become u squared minus one uh, du. So now you have, well, u cubed over three minus u plus c. So it's the secant cubed over three minus secant plus c. And that's that one. Can you please go to the, you know, earlier problem, the last problem before this, actually? Uh, this one? Uh, yeah, actually, just, well, I just want to take a quick look at it. Okay. And go a little, like, further, a little up, a little up. 
Okay. I took a screenshot of it. Okay. All right. Okay. What do we do here? So here uh, we see that the power of tangent Uh, Abdul Rahman also wanted me to scroll up. Which example did you miss? I didn't see when you said that. Case two steps. Okay, here. Here are the steps for case two. You can take a screenshot of them or something if you want to. So let's move on to this one. Natalie is out the gate with save a factor of secant tangent. So here we're going to have secant squared, tangent squared. Then we're going to pull off a secant x tangent x. Um, then what we're going to want to do is change all other tangents to secants. then you're going to do a u equals secant. Your integral is going to become u squared times u squared minus 1 du. That we can deal with by just expanding parentheses. your uncle. Okay, so these are the two quote unquote easy cases when it comes to secants and tangents. Uh, did I have another example? No, we're jumping to case three. So you can copy that or take a screenshot or at some point you're gonna, gonna post the notes. So now let's get to something exciting. Let's start. I, I don't think we're going to finish all these examples, but let's get them started. The anything else case. Now, this also has a well-defined strategy. OK, so we're in all the other cases that I did not mention here. How do we deal with them? Here's how we deal with every other case. OK? Step one, you're going to try something. Step two, hope it works out. Step three, if what you tried didn't work, try something else. In other words, get creative. Based on the first two things that I just taught you with secants and tangents, and all the strategies that you've learned before, meaning, is this a basic rule? Can it simplify it to look like a basic rule? Can a substitution work? Maybe by parts would even come into play, right? All bets are off. Anything is allowed, as long as it's mathematically correct you are going to have to be creative with all other scenarios. So let's, let's jump in. Uh, so the first one is the integral of tangent cubed. Go, ideas, quickly. Okay, so tan squared times tangent, Abdul Rahman's out the gate with a suggestion. All right, let's see what we can do with this tangent squared times tangent. Okay, what would you do with that? What can we do with that? Trig identity, question mark. What trig identity? Yeah, 
All right, so some of the things we should go in with our secant squared minus one identity. Okay, what now? What is your U? U equals secant squared. How does that help? Okay. Reload. Try again. What, what, what do you think? The derivative of secant squared is tangent. This is correct. No, the, the integral of secant squared is tangent, not the derivative. Uh, okay. Shika thinks we should expand Does that help? Right, now in the first situation, you can do a substitution. U equals tangent. Your D is going to be secant squared dx. And so you're just going to have the integral of U du. So this is going to become a, a tangent squared over two. And this one is something that we have memorized, the integral of tangent. We actually know that that is ln of secant. So this is a basic rule. And this one we use substitution. All right, so we figured, uh, we figured that one out. Can we do this one? And I'll, I'll leave the last one to you guys. Secant cubed. We'll finish this one and I'll, I'll leave you guys to figure out the last one. Save a secant factor. What you would actually get is that half secant x tangent x plus half ln absolute value of secant x plus tangent x and absolute value brackets plus arbitrary constant c. How do you know that? How do I know that? Well, yes. if you were to simply, you see secant square x times secant, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What you would actually do is tangent, you know, secant square equals tangent square x plus one times secant x. Okay. And, you know, if you were to, you know, multiply it. Okay. You know, secant x times tangent square x plus secant x, you can see on the right side, that secant x would be like, you know, the antiderivative of it would be ln, you know. Yeah, we saw that earlier. This is ln of the absolute value secant, secant x plus x. tangent x. Right. How would we do the other part? The other part, hmm. If you were to. Hmm. 
Yusuf is stumped. Come on, people, I want solutions. We're about to go over time. So in the interest of time, I'll give you guys uh, some help here. Here's the, we're going towards the standard way of doing this. So I'll tell you what, this first step is fine. Okay. Here's going to be the second step, which is going to be weird. I, I do realize this, uh, but the next thing is integration by parts. Now, me tell you that, uh, does that help? <laughs> because what happens is that, what happens is that if you try to just do, yeah, it's by parts, I know, by parts, question mark? Yeah, I wasn't kidding about secants and tangents being strange situations. By parts is going to be the way we're gonna deal with this. What you're gonna realize if you kept applying the Pythagorean identities to try to do things, it'll, it'll, at the end of the day, they're all gonna cancel each other out and you're gonna end up right back where you started. So if we had more time, I would have let you guys do it and I would have showed you that we'd have got all the way back to seek and cubed again and we'd be like, we did all that for nothing. But you know, uh, I'm gonna cut my fun short because we're uh, out of time. So yeah, that is actually a hopeless scenario. It turns out that the correct way to do this, I wouldn't say the correct way, one of the easiest way to do this is to actually break it up into a secant squared and a secant and do by parts. So now you're going to say, well, what are the parts? Does the liate even work anymore? No, it doesn't, uh, right? So notice liate doesn't even apply. So here's an integration by parts. Someone asked about this the other day where liate doesn't help because we have two trig functions here. So we are going to be have, we're, we are going to have to be a little bit creative here, but I believe in you guys. I'm, getting, I'm throwing you a bone. It's integration by parts. Tell me how you would choose the parts. Tell me why you would choose it that way. Uh, what do you think? What are the parts here? I'll try to de determine which one I could derive easier and integrate easier. Yeah, okay. All right. So what do you think? Who can we integrate easy between secant squared and secant? Who is the easier integral? Secant squared. Secant squared. Secant squared is a nice one because the integral is tangent. You, you get a trig function with a lower power. You get, a, you get one little nice guy. So yeah, break it up into that. Let's do uh, by parts with let the u be the secant and let the dv be the secant squared because I can integrate the secant squared very easily and it gets to something very nice. In fact, it's just a tangent. The du would be a secant x tangent x. Now, if I go in and I plug in my, remember it's the integral of u dv is u times v minus the integral of v du. Um, by, by the end of this weekend, I expect everyone to have that formula memorized and seared in their brain, but I'm just copying it down now because maybe you haven't had time to actually study that. But yeah, now you're going to plug these guys in. So we know that the secant cubed is going to be equal to u times v minus the integral of v du. Okay, now what? So now we have to figure out this integral. Ideas.
tell me how to deal with the integral of secant times tangent squared. What do you think? So now this is a new integral, which means you fall back on the strategies. Is it a basic rule? Can I simplify to be a basic rule? Uh, or can a substitution work? All that good stuff. What are you, what are you, which of those do you think? Well, it's not a basic rule. So the question is, could we simplify this somehow? Can I rewrite this to be nicer? Identity? <laughs> Which identity? The Pythagorean identity? Right, so the identity on tan squared, let, let's see where that takes us. Tangent squared is secant squared minus one. What can I do with that? Well, I could multiply out. Distribute. Okay, Natalie, I distributed. What do we do now? Ideas? Someone take this home? Can we separate them and work on them individually? Can we save a secant? Hmm. Uh, Professor, I see that we have integral secant cube x uh, dx equal to everything. Can we transfer? Uh, can we uh, like do i equals that? All right. So let's go with Natalie's suggestion to separate and do i equals, I know what you're thinking. So here you have a secant cubed, which you wanted to think of as i, and notice that you have this guy here, and you have this guy here. Those are actually the same guys. So now it's an algebra equation, isn't it? Just, just, just move this one over there to that one, and add them together, right? So this is going to give us two times the integral of secant cubed is equal to secant x tangent x minus the integral of sec plus the integral of secant but we already know what the integral of secant is that's ln of secant x plus tangent x plus c right that's 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 this guy integral of secant is this guy here that's a rule that we have memorized. And here we have two times the integral of, uh, the integral of secant cubed. So we can now divide by two. This is like secant cubed x dx. So this is one half times secant x tangent x plus ln of secant x plus tangent x. plus C. Crazy, right? <laughs>
Okay, you want to hear something even crazier? It is cool, but it's crazy in a way, kind of cool. Okay, so now here's something that's even crazier that you'd probably realize, really, what? Here's the crazier thing. From now on, this is a basic rule for you guys. It turns out that the integral of secant cubed shows up in calculus classes often enough that you should know it by heart. Yes. No. Yeah. It actually shows up. It, it shows up in the weirdest places, actually. And, and not only in calculus class, but for years to come. A year from now, two years from now, some of you are going to be in high-level engineering classes, high-level physics classes, and you're going to be doing all these applications with electromagnetism and electric fields and all sorts of stuff. And every now and then, you're going to see an integral of secant cube popping up out of nowhere. It's going to happen. <laughs> and even in calculus two, it happens all the time. It happens all the time. Integral of secant cube, something you should know. It just, it's one of those guys that keeps showing up. It shows up often enough for us to memorize. Which is why I believe Jason in the beginning knew what the answer was, but he didn't know how to get there. It's because he had it memorized, which is good. He should have it memorized. But this is how we actually derived the answer. But it is actually something that, yeah, from now on, you guys should know what the integral of secant cubed is. This is the largest formula that you are going to need to know, I think, in this integral class. And with that, we are going to wrap up. Uh, actually, Javon, before yes. we, like, you know, you know, we wrap up, I would like to take a look, take a look at, you know, the, the examples before the, I would like to take a look at the previous problems before we did the examples, like, you know, of the secant and tangent. Can you please scroll up? Uh, hold on. Uh, that being said, this one I want you guys to try for next class. We'll actually begin next class with that. So this is also something you should do. All right, where do you want me to scroll up to? Uh, this was the problem right before. The integral of secant cubed times tangent cubed. Okay, like before that, when there are like even powers. Uh, even to secant to the fourth tangent squared? Uh, yes. So if you were to take a look at, you know, one of the problems, like, you know, why? So what, what you would do is that you see the C, why can't you just break up, like, you know, the secants into secant cube x times secant x times tangent square x? Why isn't it like that? Yeah, but what would you have done? Well, what I would so do... So if I, I broke this up into the integral of secant cubed times secant, times tangent squared, how does that help you? What I would do is that, do you see the, uh, what am I saying? Tangent, like, you know, if you were to write something equivalent to secant cubed, such as tangent squared x plus one times secant times secant tangent squared x. So you see in this case, it would be, u square plus So it's one. going to be 1 plus tangent squared times secant times tangent squared? Yeah, and you replace and it by the u. And after What would you replace by u? The tangent. Okay, but you need a du which is secant squared, and you don't have that. You have a secant. You don't have a secant squared. Your du isn't there. Right? Yeah. So that's why we did not do that. We wouldn't have the the we wouldn't have the differential to get our substitution to work. So that's why we didn't go that route. Yeah, so that, that wouldn't have worked out. So that's why we went this route, right? So this is one of the cases that we 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 understand this case. We know what the best routes are. Right? So in case, in, in this case, in case three, that's where things get really crazy, where it's like random things, integration by parts, really? Um, but the other cases are more understood. 
Um, anyway, uh, we will stop there. Uh, hope you guys enjoyed that lecture. Uh, go back practicing, memorize all the things I actually to memorize for basic rules. Uh, we will have our quiz on Monday. I will let you guys know over the weekend what platform we are going to use. I'll definitely figure out this by then. Okay. But go over and study. Uh, the quiz covers everything up to what we did today, uh, trig integrals. But we didn't get a chance to do that much, like a practice set of problems that much. Only a little, like, exam. Yeah, but you have homework. You have homework, and you have a bunch of problems listed in your... Like, I can't be with you to do all your practice. That's something you have to do on your own time. No, like, but, like, time I'm just asking, like, you know, a bunch of problems listed what? I know it's besides, besides the homework. What else? Did you get through the homework already? Because if you didn't, that's where you start. Do all the homework. All right. And if you didn't do, good night. Bye, everybody. If you and one thing if, tell you, if you I finish the homework, go to the syllabus. There are more suggested problems. And I if you do all the suggested problems from the syllabus, then you go find, go to the textbook. Do all the even problems in that same section. There is no shortage of problems. There, you are going to have problems. I gave you already a lot of problems to do. Anyway, we're going to stop there. I just Good night, you guys. Know that, that, you know, I sent you an email, like, you know. Yes, like, that's something please. personal, though. So I don't know if you want to mention that at this point. So right. I, I got your email. So we'll, we'll discuss it. So you took a, you did you take a look at it, by the way? Yes, I got it. But you but, didn't really uh, reply, though. Because I got it right before class. Anyway, Jason, we'll deal with it later. <laughs> Bye, everybody. I'll see you in the next one.